Chapter 1. Wake up. I awoke to nothing but silence, and the heavy smell of copper. Opening my eyes, I soon found out why. I was on a black rock, surrounded by red water. No. Blood. I was surrounded by blood. While the sky above me was dark, like an endless void that could consume everything in an instant. There were no stars, no light, nothing. There were no people. I was alone. My name... I... I don't know what it is. I can't remember. I looked down at myself. I was only wearing a white dress that stopped just at my calves, with white buttons going down the middle, and nothing else, as I was barefoot. Feeling around my clothing, I felt there were pockets. Reaching into both, I soon discovered there was something in each. In the left was an ornate silver necklace, shaped like a trinity knot, with a large emerald in the center, and in my right was a note. Putting the necklace on, I opened it. Song of my soul, my voice is dead. Die thou unsung, as tears unshed. Shall die and dry in, lost in Carcosa. What mask do you wear? I wear none. I wear no mask. I scowled at the note. I recognized the first part. It was from an excript from The King in Yellow, by Robert W. Chambers. Strange that I could remember that, but not my own name. But the second part seemed more like a question directed to me, a question I could not answer. More questions mounted from this paper resting heavily on my shoulders. Why were these two things in the pockets of this dress, a dress that felt as unfamiliar as this very place? The small black rock wasn't all that large. Too small to be called an island, but large enough for me to lie down without falling into the red abyss below. Putting the note back into my pocket, I peered over the edge and down at the red water. It moved like water, but water wasn't red. At least, that's what I was sure of. Yet the smell, the smell of copper, of blood. It was so strong, so potent. This water couldn't have been blood. I didn't want to go in. But what else could I do? There was nothing here on this dark rock. Only me. Tentatively, I lowered my hand, allowing the water to touch a finger before flinching away, only to find that I felt nothing. Confused, I put my hand in, fully this time, and was bewildered at what I touched, which was nothing. It wasn't cold, nor hot, or even wet. My hand even came out completely dry. I knew the water was there, that it was the color of blood. I could see it. I could smell it. And yet, as though its existence was merely for show, that was all. And that made it all the more confusing. I steeled myself and went in, only to find that the blood, while moving like water, only coming up to just slightly above my ankles. Where am I? I said to myself, before calling out loud as I could, Hello? Can anyone hear me? But all I got in return was an echo. This place felt devoid of anything as far as the eye could see. Nothing but red and black. I had no direction. So I moved forward. With only the sound of moving water faintly reaching my ears as I walked. And I continued to walk for what felt like eons. At this point, something began to come in my line of sight. I reached somewhere. It looked like a step pyramid of sorts. One that looked as though it was carved from the blood ocean itself. Red stone stairs leading up to what looked to be a throne at the center, as if it were as from the same kind of rock. But it's who I saw that held my attention the most. Sitting at the top of the stairs, slightly off to the right side, near the throne, was a woman idly fidgeting with her thumbs as her elbows rested on her knees and a slight smile on her face. It was me but not. While she looked like me, she was different. Her long brown hair was tied back in a ponytail, held in place by a leather hairpin with a polished piece of wood, and her eyes were blue, the dark blue ring surrounding it. Her clothing was all black. 
a black turtleneck and a long black leather duster over top. Black pinstripe pants and black boots with a thick heel that looked three inches high. If she were to stand, she'd be taller than me. The only thing that was a hint of color in her outfit was a silver necklace. But instead of looking like mine, it was in the shape of the Ouroboros, a serpent eating its own tail surrounding a tree. In the center of the tree was a red stone. It looked like a spinal. Have you come to sit on the throne? No, I answered. Is that what you're waiting for? For someone to sit there? She didn't respond. She just looked at me before turning away and sighing. How long must I do this? A slight frown creased my brow. Pardon? She glanced back at me. It doesn't matter. Then she asked, what will you do? I was silent for a moment. Keep looking around, I guess. I mean, what else is there? Again, the woman that looked like me was silent. It was strange. She looked like me, sounded like me, but she wasn't me. I suppose I should call this woman the woman in black, since I had to call her something, and I don't know my name. I doubt she knew it either. Do what you want, the woman in black answered. It's all the same, anyway. I turned to leave when she said, I'll see you around. I merely glanced at her before continuing in another direction. Something about the woman in black bothered me and set me on edge. I jogged away from that strange monolith and throne, with only the sound of my feet running through the blood water to accompany me. Just how far did this go? Where were the walls? Was there an end? No matter how many times I asked myself these questions, such answers wouldn't come to me. Be it through my own or another person, besides the woman in black, there didn't seem to be anyone else. Or so I thought. Again, I saw something in the distance. It looked like two stone cliffs with a large gape in the center. It seemed strangely familiar, yet I knew deep down that I had never seen anything like it. Yet the familiarity lingered and with it, a somber sense of ease. Perhaps it was more like a feeling of nostalgia mixed with Acadia. A feeling that nothing mattered, that everything was meaningless, devoid of anything. Strange. Why would I feel that? The closer I got, the taller they became, and the more land appeared. The blood ocean seemed more like an actual ocean now, oh, there were red towering cliffs and the same red rocks scattered across in different sizes. Yet I paused when I took a step forward. The earth, or whatever was underneath my feet, felt different. It felt like sand. When I looked ahead towards those two towering cliffs, I saw that there were sand. Black sand. With smaller red rocks jutting out from that sand, and something white. Were they rocks? The closer I got, the more peeked out from the black sand. I soon realized what I was looking at. They weren't stones. They were skulls. Human skulls. A sharp pain erupted from the side of my head as the information flowed in like rushing water. I knew why this looked so familiar. Even though I had never seen such a place before, I had seen this. It was from a painting. Shores of Oblivion by German painter Eugene Brockt. Yes, that was where I had seen this before. But why was this here? What did it mean? My attention was soon drawn to the cliffs where I heard a sound. A familiar meow of a cat calling me. From in between the two towering cliffs, I saw a gray cat. A small, delicate gray cat sat between the two. The cat kept meowing until I got close enough. It looked like it was smiling as her beautiful green eyes with brown specks slowly blinked at me, sitting perfectly like those Victorian silhouettes of a cat or Egyptian statues of a goddess. I knew this cat. She is, was, my friend, but she died. 
yet I couldn't recall her name. I knelt in front of her, hand extended as she sniffed my fingers before rubbing her face against my hand. Her fur was so soft that I could hear and feel her purring. She sounded like a motorboat. I smiled despite my confusion. She then moved away and ran through the cavern between the two cliffs. Hey, I said, standing and following after. Where are you going? It wasn't like she could answer. All I could do was follow her. We wandered through this crevasse of rock for a while. It twisted and turned in a natural way. It was strange. And it widened. It was not only a dead end, but it had a fire pit that burned with bright glowing embers. All the while, my dear friend curled up in a loaf and settled into the sand. The moment I sat with her, she then moved into my lap. She felt warm, alive. With the sound and feeling of her purr along with the warmth from the fire, my eyes began to close. I tried to fight it, tried to stay awake, but it did little good. I'm not sure how long I slept, but when I opened my eyes, the fire had died down and my friend was gone. Her tiny paw prints in the sand led to a new opening, one that I either didn't notice or it had suddenly formed into the rock. Either way, it was a new path forward. Making my way through the other side was another beach. Walking up the hill, following the paw prints, I saw something that shocked me. Back along the edges of this beach, in the ocean of blood were bodies. So many bodies. Too many to count. All in various stages of decay, or something like it. There were body parts that were missing, that had something akin to a black void from the missing limbs, as though they were empty, hollow. There wasn't the smell of death. It might have been because the ocean of blood and its overpowering stench that took over my sense of smell. There was no sign of my friend, only a myriad of bodies as far as the eye could see. It looked like hell, but what bothered me, beside the number of dead, was that they all seemed to be female, all with long brown hair and all of them wearing the same dress as mine, only theirs was red, the same color as blood. It was as if I had stepped into the aftermath of a horrendous war. Bodies, bodies, and more bodies. As I walked through the blood-ridden water again, I saw the paw prints disappearing into the very same water. Trying not to disturb the remains, trying to keep from looking at those that lay all around me, I made the mistake of looking down at one of them when I stepped on their hand. Everything inside me froze. They had my face. All of them were me. Every which way I looked. Me, 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 me. What was this? This couldn't have been real, right? It couldn't have been real. Something like this couldn't exist. But it was. I couldn't deny what I saw, no matter how much my mind wanted to tell me it wasn't real. All of them were me. How was that possible? What did it mean? What was this place? My breathing began to quicken, my vision blurred as I felt the urge to scream in horror. It's okay. I turned, hearing my voice from nearby, from nearby, within the vast number of corpses. There was one that showed signs of life. Her right arm was missing, just below the elbow, as were part of her legs just above the knee as if she was nothing more than a broken doll that had its limbs removed by a destructive child. Instead of blood, it was a strange darkness seeping from her messing limbs and from her eyes that went down past her cheek like she was made of fine china before something broke her. Yet her left eye had been taken by the void. She was laying in the ocean of blood, part of her white dress slowly turning red. She looked exhausted, yet she smiled at me. A small smile with her one good eye. It's okay, she said again. You'll be okay. I knelt beside her, unable to say anything as she kept looking at me. Her eye silently following every move I made as I could see the slow rise and fall of her chest. 
Are you okay? It was a stupid thing to ask her. Of course she wasn't okay. But her answer surprised me. I will, eventually. Her gaze looked up to the black void sky. We all will. At some point. All of this will come to an end, regardless of the outcome. Though, if you ask me, I hope that outcome is a good one, no matter how foolish it might sound. How did you end up like this? I asked the broken doll. Her gaze slowly drifted back to me, like you did. I don't remember, I scowled. I don't remember how I got here. You will, Broken Doll said. You might not like the answer. It was the same for all of us who ended up here. You mean the ones in the red dresses? I looked at one, one of them near, that was nearby. The body, while mostly intact, was missing the left arm. Its eyes partly open, with dilated pupils, as it laid down on its front, head laying on the right side with no signs of breathing. She looked dead. Yes, Broken Doll replied. They aren't dead, not really, but they can't respond. Not anymore. Whatever is left is trapped inside. But it'll all be over soon. It will be for me. I'll be just like them soon enough. That's awful, was all I could say. Is there anything I can do? Broken Doll was silent for a moment. Can you stay with me? At least until my dress turns fully red? That's it? She just smiled at me. Yeah, that's it. Pretty simple, right? It sounded sad, but she was smiling. As though she had come to terms with what was in front of her. A type of death I could never understand. Even if she said they weren't dead, I found it hard to believe. To have the will to accept something like that was conflicting to me. But I would never voice it to her. Sure, I told her, as I sat beside her. I'll stay with you. Her smile grew. Thank you. We stayed like that for some time. It could have been ten minutes or ten hours. I had no real concept of time down here. But for however long it was, she asked, Can I listen to your heartbeat? Without a word, I lifted her upper body and placed her head against my chest. Broken Doll closed her eye and listened. She looked at peace. It's strange, Broken Doll said suddenly. I can remember the comfort I feel when listening to a heartbeat because of my mom, but I can't remember my name. She looked up at me. Do you know? Do you know our name? I don't, I answer honestly. I'm sorry. She laughed weakly. <laughs> Nothing to be sorry about, Broken Doll looks at the many bodies, followed by the vast expanse of this strange place. It's not your fault for forgetting. I doubt we could remember our name when we ended up here. I couldn't say anything. I merely looked at Broken Doll. The red in her dress had seeped further up and was now just under her chest. Her breathing had weakened. It sounded rasped, as her skin had become paler than before. It almost matched my white dress. She looked so tired. She was nearing her end, and there was nothing I could do for her. This feeling of powerlessness. I had felt it time and time again, of being unable to help someone, no matter how much I wanted to. The weight of that feeling was something I could never describe. For how do you describe something indescribable to others? You can't. At least that's what I felt. As her breathing rasped, becoming harder and harder to take in one breath after the other, my hold on her tightened. She lifted her perfect left hand towards the sky, as if trying to reach for something in the void struggling with what little strength she had as she strained her hand above with all her might. I looked up and saw nothing but darkness. I opened my mouth to ask her, but in that instant, the white of her dress had now become completely red like all the others, and the moment it had, the 
pupil of her eye became large and her arm fell to the ground as she gave her final breath. The broken doll was gone. She had become just like all the others in the sea of blood and corpses. I lowered my head to hers, pressing our foreheads together as I could only say one thing. I'm sorry, I hissed through gritted teeth. I'm so sorry. I held her like that for a while, or slowly lowering her into the water, taking her good arm and resting it over her abdomen. I closed her eye. I thought it'd be best to do that even though so many others had their eyes open. The only reason I could think of was because I had a small connection with her. I talked to her, and she helped me, even if it was only in a small way. I felt I needed to close her eye, because if she, what she said was true, and that she wasn't truly gone, then maybe doing this would be as though she were sleeping. And if she was asleep, and I'd hoped she'd have wonderful dreams far away from this awful place. As I stood back to my full height, I found myself looking back toward the black void that I called the sky. Just what was it that she saw to reach so desperately? Perhaps I would never know. I found myself looking back down when hearing something crack. What that sound was, was the necklace. The silver oxidized because before it and the emerald decay into a black substance like charcoal and faded into dust before disappearing into the red water. When that happened, I looked at all I looked at the other bodies and saw that none of them had the same necklace I was wearing. I guess the necklace and the white of the dress symbolized how alive you were, or something like it. But now she was gone, and I was alone with nothing but the red ocean and countless bodies around me. Broken Doll said they weren't dead, but they looked dead to me. None of them seemed to be breathing, either. How could any of them be alive at this point? With nothing else left that I could do, I looked ahead and kept moving forward, doing my best to avoid stepping on any of the women in red dresses. I hoped that, at some point, I'd find a way to get out of this place, or at least something that would tell me where I am. At what I was looking at, cat interruption. Hi, Mocha. I soon realized that I was looking. What? What? Yeah. 